and a Bachelor of Arts in Education from the University of Ilori in the year 1988 before pursuing a Bachelor of Theology and Master of Theology at the MBTS Ubumosho in 1992 bachelor of theology then 1995 master of theology these were in affiliation with the southern baptist theological seminary louisville kentucky in the united states of america he also has a master of arts in old testament studies from the university of ibadan in the year 1999 his doctoral dissertation which is titled a comparative investigation of the concept of life and death in the Old Testament and Yoruba worldview was in Ogbomosho, MBTS 2007, and also in affiliation with the University of Jos. All this exemplified his ability to bridge biblical scholarship with African perspectives. Had various positions. He has held various positions in the seminary, demonstrating his commitment to both teaching and administration. His teaching encompasses undergraduate, masters, and doctoral programs in Old Testament studies, New Testament studies, and biblical theology. He has received numerous awards recognizing his excellence. These include the Best Graduating Student Award in the Department of Educational Foundations, University of Illinois, and the Best Overall Student and Best Student in Missions and Evangelism Awards at the Nigeria Baptist Theological Seminary, Bumosho. Notably, his administrative roles included Dean of Academic Affairs, which now becomes Deputy President Academics, then Deputy President Academics. These are between the year 2014 and 2016. He was Rector of the Baptist College of Theology in Oyo from 2016 to 2019. Oladejo is a prolif prolific author, editor, and scholar with over 61 publications to his credit. These include books, edited volumes, articles, and conference papers. Let's put our hands together. His works address topics in Old Testament theology, biblical interpretation, Yoruba culture, and Christian ethics, showcasing his expertise and impact across borders. These publications reflect the deep understanding of the Bible and its ability to apply biblical insights to contemporary context. Additionally, his books for a wider audience such as The Family That Pleases the Lord and Disciples and Discipleship in the Gospel of John offer practical guidance for Christian living. His literary contributions extend beyond biblical studies, encompassing works on education, leadership, and transformation. Professor Oladejo's writings have enriched the field of biblical studies, inspiring and informing scholars. It is dedication to teaching, research, and service has, granted, has garnered his respect within the academic community and beyond. He has been married to Christiana Olutayo. Will our sister please stand up so that we know who is that Christiana Olutayo. A distinguished educator for over 30 years. They are blessed with twins, Oluwatobi and Oluwatosi. Oluwatosi is here. Please stand up. And they have a daughter-in-law, Motilade, and a granddaughter, Oluwa Darasime. Ladies and gentlemen, I want us to put our hands together for this great scholar as he comes forward 
to inaugurate his professorial seat as a scholar of distinction. Let's put our hands together. The Governing Council Chairman and Members, President, the President of the Nigerian Baptist Theological Seminary, Ogomosho, the Reverend Professor Stephen Ayokaye, the Deputy President Academics, the Deputy President Administration, the Deputy President Advancement, the Registrar, the librarian and the bosser, deans of faculties and postgraduate school of the Nigerian Baptist Theological Seminary, Ogumosho, faculty members and senior administrative staff present, officers, staff, and students of the Nigerian Baptist Theological Seminary, Ogumosho, alumni and friends of the seminary, members and friends of the Oladejo family, gentlemen of the press, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Mr. President, sir, and the distinguished audience, I am privileged to present this inaugural lecture at the Nigerian Baptist Theological Seminary of Gomosho. This lecture is noteworthy. It is a milestone since it is the first in the Department of Biblical Studies of this great institution and the fourth in the history of the seminary. My initiation into the concept of decolonization occurred during my undergraduate studies at the University of Illore, where Professor David Tuesday Adamo, my first Old Testament and Biblical instructor, introduced me to this critical discourse. He later expounded upon this theme in his own inaugural lecture. In 2021, I encountered A. O. Mujola's seminar work, God Speaks My Language, A History of Bible Translation in East Africa, published in 2020, where Mujola delves into the complexities and triumphs of translating the Bible into the languages of Eastern Africa. Mujola, who worked for United Bible Societies from 1983 through to 2015, almost 40 years, was involved in Bible translation for East Africa. He highlights the Bible's extensive history of translation into African languages, tracing its roots to the first Old Testament translation into Greek, that's the LXS, the Septuagint. He underscores the crucial role of Bible translation in Christian missions, acknowledging the active engagement of missionaries from diverse backgrounds in this endeavor. Moreover, Mojola emphasizes the inextricable link between the expansion of Christianity and the translation of the Bible into local languages. My doctoral dissertation, completed in 2007 and published in 2012, catalyzed my embrace of the colonizing 
the colonizing creed. The final recommendation from my dissertation encapsulated my earnest desire to engage in this transformative endeavor. Among other points, I had asserted in proposal that there is a need to proceed from the known to the unknown in interpreting Kohelet, that's Ecclesiastes, for the Yoruba audience. There must be a willingness to understand the people and their worldview before adequate communication of any new concept can occur. Their prevailing perception of reality and life must be considered in translating the Bible's message into their language. This quote above here resonated deeply within me, becoming a recurring theme in my academic journey. The spark ignited by Adamo in 1984 had evolved into a burning flame by 2007 and was further rekindled by Mujola's work in 2021 as I prepared unconsciously for this unique occasion. We stand at a pivotal moment in the history of translating the Bible and Christian faith for Africa. Therefore, in this lecture, I aim to delve into Bible translation and contextualization of its message for the African context. I will also highlight the imperative of current decolonization efforts while recognizing and integrating African spirituality and culture. We need to note that Africa is a tapestry of diverse civilizations and languages, a richness that intensely impacts the translation and reception of the biblical message. In many African communities, the Bible serves as the sole surviving written record, offering a deep fountain of wisdom, guidance, and hope. However, Colonial legacies and Western theological biases have influenced the translation of the Bible in Africa. The tendency to rely on English versions as source texts rather than the Bible's original languages of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek has further compounded this influence. The colonial legacies are also palpable in African church hymns and songs, architecture, costumes like the one I'm wearing, many of you are wearing, they are part of our colonial inheritances. And practices. Consequently, there is a continued need for authentic translation of the Bible and its message that resonates with ordinary Africans' everyday experiences. Decolonizing Bible translation and Christianity in Africa has been a persistent concern since the last century, and we can trace its roots back to the preceding era. Following Europe's conquest of Africa in the 19th century, missionaries translated the Bible into various African languages. These missionaries relied on indigenous consultants to grasp the target language and assist in translation tasks. The prevailing practice was to translate primarily into the most widely spoken languages or the lingua franca of the time. Decolonizing Bible translation and the Christian faith entails a commitment to fidelity to the source texts while concurrently 
I anticipate that this lecture will stimulate extensive discussion regarding the enduring necessity to decolonize Bible translation and the Christian faith, enabling African communities to reclaim ownership of their spiritual narratives and heritage, which draws upon diverse disciplines, including linguistics, culture, politics, and philosophy. Its ultimate goal is to bridge the gap between historical texts, faith, and contemporary contexts, fostering active engagement with the biblical message among individuals from all walks of life. However, current translation practices often prioritize linguistic accuracy over the crucial task of conveying the Bible's message in a manner that resonates with Africa's unique cultural and contextual realities. Thus, this lecture probes into decolonizing Bible translation in Africa, a critical effort that demands a reassessment of prevailing paradigms and a conscious integration of resources from African cultures, languages, and worldviews. By prioritizing cultural relevance, decolonized Bible translation empowers African communities to cultivate a deeper understanding of their faith within the framework of their own cultural and linguistic context. Justification for my topic. Mr. President, sir, the first part of the title of my lecture, Global God and local languages underscores the profound connection between language and our understanding of the divine and the shared human experience. This connection fosters global unity among Christians, enabling them to celebrate their diverse roots while at the same time acknowledging the common principles that bind them together. The connection between a global God and the diversity of human languages may appear immediately paradoxical, but the Bible reveals a nuanced interplay between these two ideas, presenting a vision of unity in diversity. First, the story of Babel in Genesis chapter 11 serves as a deterrent anecdote portraying humanity's unified language as a tool for egotism and self-sufficiency prompting God's intervention to diversify tongues and scatter humanity. This serves as a reminder of the dangers of uniformity and the potential for language to engender division. However, Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 presents a contrasting image. The Holy Spirit empowers believers to speak in various tongues, enabling them to transcend linguistic barriers and share the gospel message with a diverse audience. This amazing event signifies a reversal of Babel assenting God's desire for inclusivity and communication across cultures. Evidently, the Bible's message transcends ordinary words as Micah chapter 6 verse 8 underscores the ex the, that expressing faith through actions and deeds indicating that love, compassion, and service transcend language barriers, uniting people under a shared banner of humanity. Moreover, the Bible's translation into diverse languages reflects God's intention for not only inclusivity, but also accessibility, and further emphasizes the importance of respecting local languages. 
by making sacred texts accessible in one's native language, faith becomes deeply personal and relatable. Cultural nuances and expressions enrich understanding, fostering a deeper connection with the divine message. This aligns with the creation narrative in Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 to 28, where humanity is entrusted with stewarding and cultivating diversity on earth. This celebration of linguistic diversity extends beyond culture, scripture. Recognizing the diverse linguistic backgrounds within a community enriches worship, fosters inclusivity, and promotes cross-cultural understanding within the global community. Consequently, the biblical perspective reveals that the relationship between a global God and local language is not one of contradiction. of languages and cultures, we better reflect ultimately. True unity transcends earthly boundaries and linguistic divides, uniting us in the shared embrace of a universal God. Furthermore, the entire topic itself aligns with a growing discourse, including increasing awareness of how colonialism has shaped Bible translation practices. The growing participation of African scholars and theologians in Bible translation initiatives and the development of new technologies that enhance the efficiency and cost effectiveness of Bible translation. The topic is vital because it bears the potential to enhance the accessibility of the Bible for Africans. These Availability is crucial given the Bible's sacred status for millions of Africans and its potential to bring hope, wisdom, and guidance to their lives. An inaugural lecture on this topic holds significant value for biblical studies. It will provide continued impetus for discussions on critical issues in Bible translation and raise awareness of the need to decolonize its process. With all humility and strength, I propose that the God of the Bible is global and his word, the Bible, and his message are global. However, the Bible is also deeply rooted in local languages and cultures. This necessitates translating the Bible into local languages, enabling individuals to engage with the text in their expressions. Consequently, this lecture argues that traditional methods of Bible translation rooted in European languages and cultures have inadequately communicated the biblical message to African people. And I am calling for a new approach that embraces the African context and utilizes African languages and cultures, not as a new call, but as an echo of a call that has gone even beyond me. Decolonizing Bible translation is crucial for several reasons. It enables Africans to read the Bible in their language and fosters a natural and comfortable understanding. It breaks down barriers between African culture and the Christian faith, encouraging Africans to see the Bible as relevant and essential, actually to own the Bible as their Bible. It also promotes a more inclusive and diverse understanding of Christianity breaking down barriers between groups. Mr. President, my literary pursuits are focused on translating the Bible and its core ideas into the Yoruba language. I have also explored Yoruba philosophy, Yoruba category, Yoruba worldview, highlighting the adaptation of biblical texts and messages to fit specific 
African cultural and societal context. My works emphasize the importance of integrating African cultural and spiritual essentials, the positive outcomes observed in the Yoruba context, and the valuable understanding acquired. Yoruba, the indigenous language of the Yoruba people, is primarily spoken in the southwestern region of Nigeria. It is spoken in the Republic of Benin. It is spoken in Togo. It is spoken in Brazil, in Sierra Leone, and in Cuba. There are approximately 15 dialects of the Yoruba language. But there is a standardized Yoruba that is used for the official written form. Crowder's translation of the Bible in 1884 established it as the accepted benchmark for written Yoruba. And this accomplishment has resulted in the growth and spread of Yoruba language and literature, serving as a fundamental basis for an extraordinary cultural manifestation on the African continent. It is in view of the foregoing that the thesis of this lecture is that the effectiveness of Christianity in the African context hinges on its ability to reconcile its global and local dimensions. While the Christian faith is universal, it must manifest in a way that resonates with African cultures and languages to ensure a meaningful connection with the African populace. This connection necessitates a recognition of God's global nature while simultaneously acknowledging the importance of communicating his message through the local tongues of Africa. And so those of you who have been waiting for me, this is what I meant metaphorically when I postulated a few months ago that God must learn to speak to us in our local languages, not in English. So when I told you I was going to teach God how to speak Yoruba, that's what I meant. Mr. President, sir, defining translation and interpretation is a very critical effort in this lecture. Translation and interpretation are indispensable tools for conveying messages and their intended meaning from one language to another. In essence, translation involves the smooth and reliable transmission of the original message, often through a written medium. While interpretation focuses on oral or instantaneous translation, both processes demand a profound understanding of language, culture, and the subject matter at hand, along with the ability to accurately grasp the intricacies of the source language and authentically convey them in the target language. The field of translation and interpretation has witnessed significant advancements due to technological innovations, particularly in machine translation and artificial intelligence. These advancements have brought about groundbreaking developments in translation capability. However, further innovations are still required to effectively capture the intricate nuances of language and cultural context. In the African context, the concept of translation is used in diverse ways. Actually, as a biblical scholar, Mr. President, my academic journey has been dedicated to comprehending the multifaceted role of translation in shaping African Christianity. In its diverse forms, translation has been instrumental in propagating Christianity, yes, adapting it to African cultural context, yes, and fostering theological exploration. 
the concept of translation in African Christianity encompasses various forms, including linguistic, cultural, theological, sociological, and syncretic translation. These forms have played a crucial role in the propagation and adaptation of Christianity in Africa. Linguistic translation serves as a cornerstone of Christian propagation in Africa as it entails rendering biblical texts and other Christian materials into the diverse languages spoken on the continent. And there have been more than 1,000 African languages into which the Bible has been translated. Cultural translation extends beyond mere linguistic transfer. It includes adapting Christian beliefs and practices to align with the unique cultural context of African societies. Theological translation delves into interpreting Christian doctrines and teachings within the African context. African theologians and scholars engage in theological discourse, examining the compatibility of traditional African concepts with African experiences and addressing theological questions that Africans ask and are specific, specific to African realities. Social translation explores transformative impact of Christianity on the social structures, interactions, and customs of African communities. Christianity has been an agent of societal, societal change, influencing gender roles, family dynamics, education, healthcare, and communal development. Syncretic translation involves assimilating indigenous African religious themes and rituals into Christian worship and theology. Blending African traditions and Christian doctrines has given rise to unique manifestations of Christianity in Africa. These distinct translation modes in African Christianity are not mutually exclusive. They often intersect and interact, creating a rich tapestry of understanding and expression. Researchers and writers use translation in many ways uh, while examining African Christianity. This demonstrates the sophisticated and dynamic nature of African Christianity. A prominent scholar in this matter was Lamine Sané, a distinguished Gambian scholar and historian of religion. He has been one of my very permanent influence on my life. Uh, Sane underscored the significance of translation in religious communication and the dissemination of religious concepts. And he contended that the translation of Christian scriptures and catechisms into African languages had a crucial impact on the revitalization of culture, the awakening of society, the rebirth of religion, and the mutual exchange of missions, both during and after the period of colonialism. Sane promoted the localization of religious literature, particularly for Christian missionary work in Africa. Mr. President, sir, in my own academic endeavors, particularly in this lecture, I have adopted a broad understanding of translation, incorporating most of the facets I have discussed. I use the term translation to include textual translation of the Bible and the interpretation of its message for Christian faith and life. This choice reflects both my instinctive inclination and a deliberate stylistic preference. I consistently strive for this inclusive approach, even when I emphasize one or a combination of explicit or implicit aspects of translation. In one of my works, which has become a landmark in my efforts to decolonize the translation of the Bible into the Yoruba language, 
I explicitly state as follows. Translation typically refers to converting a message from one language to another. In this scenario, attention is directed towards the linguistic dynamics and correspondences in the two languages involved. Nevertheless, Lamin Sane has employed a more comprehensive interpretation of the word in his work translating the message. Sane examined the process of translating the Bible and its message into many languages across generations, starting from the early days of the church's missionary work. This encompassed several aspects including the textual, the theological, and leadership layers. And so in that paper, I use the term comprehensively and accommodatingly. This statement has constantly guided my attempts to interpret biblical message for the African setting, explicitly targeting the Yoruba people of West Africa. My exposure to diverse academic disciplines such as education, systematic theology, philosophy, Christian ethics, and biblical studies has consistently enriched and inclined me to translate the Christian scriptures into meaningful and relevant terms for African context, particularly within my Yoruba worldview. My research investigates connecting the Christian scriptures with African context, enhancing their applicability and impact. While translating the Bible into human languages is complex, I have aimed to improve my understanding of its importance for African Christianity and develop more proficient approaches to utilizing, utilizing translation to promote genuine Christian worship and social change. Mr. President, sir, Translating divine speech into human languages is a complicated endeavor which poses unique challenges due to the inherent disparities between the divine and the human realms. Religious discourse is characterized by its profound and transmutative influence, intricate cultural and historical contexts, complex theological concepts, and unwavering authority. While defining the essence of divine speech, these characteristics present significant hurdles in translating it to ac accurately and effectively into human languages. The fundamental differences between divine and human communication necessitate a nuanced approach to translation. Translators must grapple with the inherent limitations of human language in fully capturing the depth and breadth of divine meaning. Furthermore, divine speech is frequently embedded in specific cultural and historical contexts, making it difficult to translate for individuals unfamiliar with these references. For instance, biblical allusions to Hebrew culture may require interpretation for non-Hebrew readers. Additionally, divine concepts, theological depth, and complexity demand a meticulous understanding of the original language's theological lexicon, interpretive intricacies, and biblical context to ensure accurate translation. Despite these challenges, Translating divine speech into human languages is a crucial requirement to enable individuals from diverse backgrounds to assess and engage with divine revelation. It fosters a deeper understanding of the divine message, promotes cultural communication, cross-cultural communication, and preserves the authenticity and comprehensibility of sacred texts. While no translation can achieve absolute perfection, capable translators can create renditions that faithfully convey the original meaning of divine speech while considering the target audience specific needs. Mr. President, sir, the Bible translation 
process into African languages has been crucial in expanding Christianity and advancing local cultures and languages. What I've said there is that it's a mutual influence. If I, in one of my writings, I had to demonstrate that it's not only the Bible that influenced Yoruba culture, Yoruba culture has influenced the Bible. There's no argument about it. The evidences are limitless. Mujola provides a comprehensive overview of the current state of Bible translation in Africa, if you would wish to read him. European missionaries undertook the first Bible translations in Africa during the colonial era, and several scholars had underscored the fact that the Bible translation in post-colonial Africa and its role in restoring woman dignity through artistic expression. Such scholars delve into the challenges and opportunities of translating the Bible in Africa, and they emphasize the importance of incorporating African perspectives and languages. Their contribution is part of a larger volume that examines the preservation of post-colonial translation studies and their relevance to post-colonialism, focusing on Africa. The authors offer valuable insights into the intersection of translation, post-colonialism, and the African context. Mr. President, sir, and the distinguished audience, translating the Old Testament into African languages presents a unique set of challenges. Due to distinct characteristics of biblical languages, the vast diversity of African languages, the temporal disparity between biblical and African worldviews, and the impact of colonialism and foreign ideologies on the translation process. The Old Testament encompasses many literary journeys including prose, laws, narratives, poetry, prophecies, and wisdom texts. Translating these diverse germs into African languages requires careful consideration of the cultural and linguistic nuances of both the source and target languages. The Bible was written in ancient times, reflecting the era's linguistic, cultural, and contextual realities. And so translators must bridge the temporal gap, gap between the biblical world and the contemporary African milieu, ensuring that the biblical message is conveyed accurately, clearly, and naturally to an African audience. Africa also has its own linguistic diversity with over 2,000 languages spoken across the continent. And this diversity poses a significant challenge in ensuring accuracy and clarity for speakers of diverse languages. Mr. President, translating the Bible into Yoruba language presents additional complexities due to its distinctive characteristics. The Yoruba language possesses a unique grammatical structure and idiomatic expressions that may not have direct counterparts in any other language. This poses a challenge in conveying the whole meaning and nuances of the original scriptural text. Concepts central to the Christian faith such as grace, salvation, and redemption often require multiple words or phrases in Yoruba to convey their meaning. This can lead to challenges in accurately representing the depths and the complexity of these concepts. Moreover, the Yoruba language has a rich oral tradition that forms the basis for many expressions and idioms. Translating the Bible into Yoruba necessitates a profound understanding of this cultural heritage and the ability to communicate its subtle intricacies through written language effectively. 
The Yoruba language has numerous dialects, necessitating careful consideration to ensure comprehensibility among all Yoruba speakers. Biblical Hebrew and Yoruba belong to different language families, resulting in significant differences in grammatical structure, vocabulary, and phonetics. This linguistic divergence poses challenges in translating abstract concepts like sin and shalom, which may have yet to have direct equivalents in Yoruba. The Yoruba culture has unique customs, beliefs, perspectives, and translating biblical materials into Yoruba requires bridging the cultural gap between the ancient Near East and contemporary Yoruba society. This involves identifying suitable counterparts, idiomatic phrases, and culturally relevant illustrations to convey the intended meanings effectively. Translating the Bible into African languages. Translating the Bible into African languages requires, particularly Yoruba, a deep understanding of biblical and African. I give just a few examples. First, there is the Hebrew word Melek. Melek translates king. But I can tell you that king in the Bible is equivalent of president because it was king of a nation, not king of a town. So when you are translating the word king, you rather call it president and not oba. There is also the word ekal. Ekal can be translated temple, but it can also be translated palace, depending on the context. Because it is accepted that the temple is the palace of Yahweh. So he is the king in the temple. It is also accepted that the king who rules on earth represents God in an earthly palace. So the word temple, palace, for one Hebrew word requires that you are aware of the two contexts as you translate. One of the most radical words in Hebrew is the word esed. Esed, in your Psalm 136, that's the word that is repeated over and over again in the refrain. It can be translated favor. It can be translated mercy. It can be translated love. It can be translated loyal love. It can be translated kindness. It can be translated grace. And so, you have to be very careful as you read the word in its context to be able to locate what it represents in its equivalent in Yoruba. But the final word I want to point to there is Barak. This is because in Job chapter 2, verse 9, some of us have read in more than 90% of translations, Job's wife told Job, Birek Yahweh. That Barak can mean blessing, but it can also mean curse. Fortunately or unfortunately, when it is used in all its configurations in the entire Old Testament, more than 95% of the times, it is translated blessing, not curse. Now, most of our Bible translations accept in Job 2.9 that Job was saying, curse God and die. That cannot be so. It cannot be so in the context of Job. Because in the ancient Near East, you don't have the courage to curse God. Who, who, who are you to curse God? In the average, normal, contemporary Yoruba context, 
Can you imagine anybody telling you to curse God? It's unimaginable. So what was Job's wife saying? And I may have to demand that you use a red Bible to do something on your Bible. Job's wife was saying, bless God and die. Because the word Barak actually means kneel down, submit, worship. And so the wife of Job was saying, why don't you just submit totally to his will? And when you die, you will meet him. And all these questions you are asking, you can ask him. Mr. President, sir, my contributions to decolonizing scripture translation are just in the continuation with what others have done. Good. Sir, my academic journey has been driven by a dual passion. Unraveling the richness of biblical texts and ensuring their transformative power resonates with the African context. This manifests a two distinct but intertwined streams, practical and devotional materials catering to everyday faith, and scholarly endeavors fostering theological discourse and decolonizing Bible translation. My early works, like fam the family that pleases the Lord, laid the groundwork for my later exploration of contextualized biblical interpretation emphasizing the need for families to navigate their everyday lives guided by biblical principles. This theme continues in current Baptist practices in 2012, which critically examines worship trends within the Nigerian Baptist Convention, advocating for rigorous reinterpretation of biblical texts to ensure their relevance and meaningful application. Similarly, my biblical teaching on prayer 2014 delves into contemporary prayer practices, identifying elements that nurture both individual and denominational well-being. These works represent a cornerstone of my commitment to contextualizing biblical messages and reflect my growing understanding of the need for the Bible for Bible translations that resonate with African audiences. My publications consistently engage with the realities of African Christianity. In 2015, I wrote Household Gods in Jewish Cosmology and the Challenges of Syncre Fetish Practices Among Yoruba Christians, exploring the complexities of syncretism and the challenges of achieving full biblical orientation within African context. In 2013, I wrote on abolism, healing, and health, developing a biblical attitude. Therein, I challenge prejudices against natural medicine, and I advocate for a balanced, informed approach to traditional medicine and holistic health care within African Christian communities. I encourage African Christians to embrace responsible use of natural remedies while remaining grounded in scripture. My academic pursuits delve deeper into specific themes relevant to African Christianity. My analysis of wealth 
interpretations in an exegesis of Deuteronomy 8 in 2009 challenges misinterpretations of wealth prevalent among Pentecostal and other gospel ministers. This work highlights the need for hermeneutical methods grounded in authentic Christian logic and sensitive to the African worldview. My exploration of ecclesiology in Ecclesiology Believers Fellowship in 2014 emphasizes the importance of community in authentic worship, challenging individualistic interpretations. And my work in 2017 to Nexus between environmental and Christian theologies addresses the critical need for environmental awareness within Christian, African Christianity. My dedication to indigenizing theology shines through in co-edited works like Contemporary Issues in Systematic Theology and African Christian Perspective, Indigenization of the Church in Africa, the Nigerian Situation. These works explore the ongoing process of contextualizing theology in Africa and they highlight the importance of African voices and perspectives in theological discourse. My contributions to higher education include co-editing development of Christian higher education in Africa, profiling the states of the field, and pedagogy, church leadership, and theological education in 2014, emphasizing leadership training in theological education. Editing studies in Pauline writings further demonstrates my commitment to making theological resources available and accessible within the African theological landscape. Decolonizing Bible translation, my signature contribution. Thus far, it is in translation and the reciprocal impacts of Yoruba Bible and Yoruba culture, published in 2016, that my contribution to decolonizing Bible translation finds its clearest expression. This work emphasizes the crucial dialogue between the Bible and the African cultures thread of Christianity and Yoruba culture. I highlight the positive and negative impacts of the Yoruba Bible on Yoruba culture and traditional religions, and I advocate for a critical scrutiny of this dynamic relationship. My research demonstrates the Bible's translation enriching Yoruba culture while providing frameworks for expressing faith authentically. My publications have spanned diverse areas, yet they all share a common thread, my unwavering commitment to decolonizing Bible translation. I am dedicated to making the Bible accessible, meaningful, and transformative for African communities. My contributions to decolonizing Bible translation go beyond mere scholarly pursuit. They represent a fervent belief in my heart in the importance of empowering African scholars and theologians advocating for decolonizing methodologies, emphasizing the need for contextually relevant translations that speak to the hearts and minds of African audiences. This journey is far from over, and I remain committed to using my scholarship to foster deeper engagement with the world, one that is rooted in both fidelity and cultural sensitivity ultimately enriching the lives and faith of Christians across Africa. Mr. President, sir, I wish to conclude by making some recommendations. Decolonizing Bible translation for the African context demands multifaceted approach that embrace. So I recommend that African scholars and theologians must be actively involved throughout the translation process, leveraging their deep understanding of African cultures and languages to ensure that translation accurately conveys the biblical message 
while resonating with African idioms. Allowing the Bible to speak to African hearts and minds. These linguistic, authentic, biblical scholars, thirdly, and theologians must continue contextualizing theological terms and avoid, deliberately, avoid imposing Western theological concepts, carefully considering their relevance to African perspectives. Scholars should provide clear explanations to prevent misinterpretations and ensure textual integrity all the time. African theologians and biblical scholars should consciously acknowledge the impact of colonialism. We cannot pretend that we have been colonized and that we are still being recolonized. We cannot deny it. We must affirm it so that we treat it as a virus that must be dealt with. Biblical scholars should promote open interpretations as they seek to embrace the diversity of African thought and welcome new interpretations of the biblical text. Six, theological institutions and biblical Bible translation organizations should create diverse translation teams by assembling translators representative of the continent's linguistic and cultural diversity. This will ensure a translation that resonates with varied experiences of African people. Mr. President, sir, by implementing this, the other recommendations in my work, with care and sensitivity, we can continue to foster a decolonized Bible translation process that respects African cultures and perspectives, bringing the Bible's message to life for African readers. Mr. President, sir, I am deeply grateful to God, Yahweh El Shabbat, the Almighty, for his love, mercy, his kindness, his favor and his grace. He is the source of all wisdom and knowledge. And I give him all the glory for my accomplishments. I am grateful for the gifts of salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord and the gifts of the Holy Spirit who has continued to empower and to guide me. I dedicate this lecture to the evergreen memory of the former General Secretary of the Nigerian Baptist Convention, the first head of Biblical Studies Department of this great institution, an Associate Professor and Supervisor, the Reverend Dr. Samuel Ted to Eternal Glory, August 2007. Few months after painstakingly and successfully supervising my doctoral studies and the surviving family. Comfort Olade for their love, their sacri perseverance, and they sacrificed so much to ensure I reached a good I do not use late for anyone. Nobody dies in Yoruba context. They only change address. <laughs> so you won't find a late, late, late. There's no late. For me, all of them, the ancestors are alive. I thank Dickness Eunice is here for their encouragement, support, and prayers. I'm also thankful to my numerous siblings and extended family members, especially my brother, Mr. my maternal uncle, Pa Joseph Oladoye Bridge. He was a descent, was a father figure, my mentor and a dependable ally in all godly respects. I thank God for his exemplary Christian life, and I remain eternally grateful to his surviving family. I'm grateful to all my teach professors of the University Tuesday Adamo, Professor I for their mentorship and guidance. I'm deeply indebted to all my seminary professors for their mentorship and guidance throughout my study. Professor my MTH, when it was PhD, I said, no, I will become another Obaji. 
Dr. Donald Copeland and his wife Evelyn, Dr. Uche Eyoa, Dr. Yakubu Otijele, Professor Robert S. Bonny and his wife, Professor Edith Bonny, Dr. Gabriel Ojo and Professor Joseph Ilori. I thank all my destiny helpers along my spiritual and ministerial journey, including the anonymous Christian brothers who preached to me for years and prepared me for a personal salvation experience. Mrs. Rhoda Abosede Omotosho, Reverend Olusegun John Omotosho, Dr. Samson Olubade Akamu, Reverend and Mrs. J. Oladokun, and Dr. and Mrs. Solomon Ademola Ishola, I thank you. This includes all former and current members of Zion Baptist Church at the Wale Estate Lori, Kwara State, where I worshipped while at the University of Ilori. God used that congregation to sponsor my baccalaureate education at this seminary for two and a half years. I'm forever grateful to them. I thank all former and current members of the Baptist Student Fellowship of University of Ilori, where I first caught my academic, spiritual, and ministerial teeth. I appreciate all my Nigerian Baptist Theological Seminary faculty colleagues. I appreciate you. I'm also grateful to professors Emiolani Hilola, Stephen Nayankaye, Esther Ayadokun, John Einaya, Moses Audi, Emmanuel Oyemomi, Olushola Yobiremi, Simon Ishola, Elin Ishola Eson, Simon Kolawali, and their families for their direct and indirect contributions to my total formation. I thank all my former classmates, classmates roommates, at the University of Illorin from 1984 to 88, the University of Ibadan from 1998 to 99, and the Nigerian Baptist Theological Seminary, I celebrate all my ministry friends. I celebrate all those I supervised at the first degree, at the graduate, at the postgraduate levels. At the PhD level, those that I have supervised including Drs. Moses Adeyemo, Benjamin Adeboye, Gaolale, Kamba Midele, Okechuku Okore, Solomon Olade, Jobaba Lola, Adenrele Afolabi, Emmanuel Eniola, and Julius Indishwa. The deeming group includes Oladapo, Olaleye, Samuel Ulushegun, Olaluwa, Victor Uwolabi, John Olaiwola, and all who completed their programs in the Biblical Studies Department. I am grateful to all Baptist churches I have worked. I am grateful to all who have helped me read through and to edit this work painstakingly. I am grateful to my twins, Uluwa Tobi and Uluwa Tosin. They were the first readers of this text. My wife, Ulu Tayomi, read through it. My older brother's wife, Dr. Ayobami Ayayinka, read through it. My beloved Dr. Okechuku Okore, my brother and friend, Professor Simon Ishola, and Reverend Dr. Folasha de Oloyede, they had their personal imputes. Finally, I thank my wife, Mrs. Christiana Olutayo Oladejo, for her inexpressible loyal love and care for more than 30 years of walking and working together. I celebrate your patience and your perseverance all through our existential experiences. I am very grateful to my daughter-in-law. Process. I am truly blessed to have a family that made sacrifices. God bless you all round and really. All glory be unto Yahweh Elohim forever. Toda Raba Amin. Thank you very much, my people.
round of applause again. Thank you very much. Please be seated. We give God the glory for what he has done in our community again. And we congratulate once again our beloved brother and the family, the Reverend Professor God, we continue to renew your strength. We really appreciate your effort. Uh, before I, you, you, you want to do something today, whatever, no. This is an academic environment and anything like that. Uh, as usual, we just recognize people and we move out because it's a professor and he has professed. Who are you to challenge him? Uh, so we just move out, continue to celebrate God in his life and take time to go through the lecture if you meet him on the way one day and you have the chest to raise questions you go and raise that with him uh -huh. <laughs> so the department that has something maybe after a recession and you want to do something after a picture to take in outside there you may do that we do not bring in any other program into inaugural lecture. Uh, this evening, by God's grace, we will have to step down the koinonia. We've been in conference ITEC since uh, Tuesday with this inaugural lecture. I think with this uh, hot weather, we need some time to rest. So we will not come back for koinonia uh, this evening. The one that God has prepared, by God's grace, will come up again. It's one of us. She will understand. We want to really recognize the presence of some of us here. I will start by recognizing Mama uh, Ola Dejo, uh, the beloved wife of the inaugural lecturer. So you are welcome. So, and I, I think our beloved daughter has gone to handle some things. That is okay. The way I'm seeing those who are seated here, uh, I recognize you. I, 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 I can't remember your, I, I don't even know your names. But we recognize you, sir and ma, for being here with us. God bless him. We continue to be upon your lives. Here, are also involved in some issues Especially, I know Professor Gunwale is even in Abuja. So, but don't let me assume. Do we have any other governor present the council? Uh -huh. So, thank you very much. So, thank you very much for being here on behalf of the council. God will continue to bless you. Uh, I don't know if you have anyone from the Nigerian Baptist Convention, either department. Uh, of the convention who is here. We want to recognize you, that department, or our Congress of Rise Up. Rise Up wherever you are. We recognize you. Thank you very much for being there for us. God, we continue to uh, bless you. Where? Uh, you're going, and I'll, I'm coming to him. So, So one of the things is that because he used to respect uh, his boys when they speak, and I know today he will not uh, disappoint. So he will be coming over here. <laughs> uh, you know, Baba Professor Ayegboyi, uh, after sucking the leadership breast, he transferred it to Professor Emiola Nilola. Those of you who may not know, Professor Ayigboyin was president of the seminary who handed over to Professor Emiola Nilola. We are grateful having you around. He's been around for about two days now, supporting us in the conference. And let me leak a secret. 
you, this president, Professor Dijai Gbeyin, Professor Emiolani Lola, and Professor Baji, go and check your diary. You must be in the minister's conference. There is a panel discussion for the president. And if our boss in the convention agrees with us, he will moderate that panel during the minister's conference. 